to the cloud and now we'll dive in. So this is a side from, we, let's try that again. We introduced the idea of an instantaneous rate of change. Then we saw that we could study <coughs> that concept via what we now know is a limit. We didn't use that word at the time, but when we were letting those H's get closer and closer to zero, we were taking a limit. And then we went on kind of that long series of lectures on limits, and none of that stuff was very clearly motivated, except maybe continuity. You can sort of see where continuity might come up in real world situations. But in this section, we're going to see another very applied application of the limit. And that's sort of in looking at the future and trying to predict what happens as time passes. Um, this section is broken up into two pieces, though. So before we get to that application, let's look at another topic involving infinity. Infinite, and you see I put limits in the quotation marks. Limits don't have to exist. And there are a bunch of ways that a limit might fail to exist, or well, at least three ways that a limit might fail to exist. Back in the continuity quiz, you saw a lot of limits failing to exist because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit were different. We're going to introduce this section by talking a little about another way that a limit might fail to exist. And we already touched on this briefly, but the limit as X approaches C of a function might not exist. And one of the reasons this limit might not exist is that as X approaches C, F of X, rather than approach some finite number might explode up to positive infinity. Or f of x might explode downwards to negative infinity. And so I say we did look at examples of this, but that was long ago, let's um, do share, no, okay, let's go to Desmos, let's see if this new share wants to work, there we go, and let's look at f of x equals one divided by x minus two squared. And let's look at the limit as x approaches two. And we'll investigate this limit using a table like we did back in the beginning of this class. Here's X, here's F of X. And you see 
that as X approaches two, this function is not approaching any finite number, but is going up to infinity. And that happens whether X approaches two from the left, or whether x approaches two from the right. Either way, the closer we get to two, the larger these numbers get. So this limit doesn't exist. And we have a bit of notation for when a limit fails to exist in this way. Usually if a limit doesn't exist, we just write to DNE, it does not exist. But if a limit is failing to exist in this specific way, it gets its own piece of notation. We write that the limit as X approaches C of the function equals infinity. Or as the case may be, we write the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals was negative is infinity. So in reference to that graph on Desmos, the limit as X approaches two of one divided by X minus two squared equals positive infinity. So we have this notation and there are a few things I just sort of want to hit on with this notation. The first thing I want to hit on and let me write this big because it's important. These limits do not exist. Going back to the first frame of this lecture, you'll notice that I wrote the word limits in quotation marks, in, in scare quotes. If we have something like this, we are not saying that the limit is infinity. We are saying that the limit does not exist, but that the limit fails to exist. in a specific way. So just because we are writing that, don't go thinking that we're treating infinity as a number here, and that we're saying the limit equals this number. That's not at all what's happening. We're saying that the limit doesn't exist and that it doesn't exist in this specific fashion. As X approaches C, F of X is blowing up to infinity or blowing up, blowing down to negative infinity. The second thing that I want us to recognize is that this notation is a sign. And if that's not clear, what I mean is you can have 
infinity or negative infinity on the right-hand side of that equality. And those are telling you different things. If we write that the limit is infinity, that means the function is increasing in a positive direction. If we write that the limit is negative infinity, that means that the function is sinking down to negative infinity. So let me return to Desmos. If I take this function and just modify it a little, if I put a negative sign in front of it, then you see that instead of going up, these values of f of x are going down. And you would write that the limit as x approaches two of negative one over x minus two squared equals negative infinity. So positive infinity, negative infinity. Um, in both cases, these limits don't exist, let's remember, but saying that the limit is infinity or the limit is negative infinity is saying that the limit fails to exist in two distinct ways. And because of this, because the limit is assigned, we often cannot use this notation or at least we must be careful with this notation. And to illustrate what I'm talking about here, let's go back Desmos one final time. And let's modify this function a little, a little further. You see that I have x minus two squared. I'm just going to get rid of this square. And now what happens as x approaches well, as x approaches 2 from the left, 1.9, 1.99, and so on, these values of f of x are exploding down to negative infinity. Negative 10, negative 100, negative 1,000, and so on. But as we approach to from the right, these numbers are exploding up to positive infinity. 10, 1,000, 100,000, and so on. So, we cannot right that the limit as x approaches 2 of 1 divided by x minus 2 equals infinity 
because this is saying that as X approaches two, the function is getting really big in the positive direction. And that's, I guess, more than one more time after all, we're going to Desmos. But anyway, that's not true. It's not true that as X approaches two, the function is getting big in the positive direction. Look at this negative 10, this negative 100, this negative 1,000, this negative 10,000. So we can't write that the limit is positive infinity, but just as let me give myself space to work. But just as we can't write that it's positive infinity, we can't write that it's negative infinity. If the limit were negative infinity, that says that as X approaches two, the values of F of X are sinking down to negative infinity. And that's not what's happening. Look at this 10, this 1,000, this 100,000. So we cannot always use this notation, even though I mean, our intuition, perhaps, is that as X approaches two, these numbers are getting really big. Negative 10,000 is sort of, in our intuition, is a big number. 100,000 is a big number. But we cannot use this equals infinity notation. Let's try that chair a second time. What we could write is that the limit as x approaches to from the left of one divided by x minus two equals negative infinity and the limit as X approaches to from the right of one divided by X minus two equals positive infinity. If we wanted to insist on this notation, we would have to use one-sided limits. So going back to this frame, if we cannot write this, if we can't write that this limit is negative infinity, or positive infinity, what do we write? Well, we don't have any special notation. If we don't want to write that statement here, that statement here involving one-sided limits, we just write that this limit DNE four does not exist. And we can't use our infinity, negative infinity notation. Let me see, any questions so far? And let me give an example. of what we call a determinate form. And 
eventually they will start talking about indeterminate forms and this kind of terminology will gain some meaning. For now, don't worry about this phrase so much, just recognize the following. Any number divided by infinity is, well, this is a kind of trivial statement. Infinity is not a number, so you can't define, divide by it. But what we're really saying here is that if you're taking the limit as X approaches C of a fraction, the first thing you would try to do is to use the quotient rule. Um, So you would take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom. Wait. Uh, scrap. This is not what I. This is not what I want to talk about now. I thought it was, but it's not. Um, because I need to talk about limits. No, sorry. I know this is a little sloppy, but just cross this out in your notes. It's not true. Um, I mean, it's just frankly false. I wrote down this the incorrect. Thing. What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to get at is where do limits like this come from? But before, what I was trying to say was the father. Let me write this down. Where do these I don't want to call them limits, because remember that these limits, so-called, do not exist. Where do these non-limits come from? Well, they can come from a number of things, but one place that they can come from is the following. You're taking a limit as X approaches C of a fraction. And you try to use the fraction rule as one does. And when you take the limit in the numerator and you take the limit in the denominator, In the numerator, you get something other than zero. And maybe something like this happens. You get something other than zero in the numerator, zero in the denominator. Well, strictly speaking, our quotient rule has failed here. Our quotient rule had the, the condition attached to it that we can only use it if it doesn't give us a division by zero. 
But if we use our quotient rule and we end up with something like this, we are enabled to say two things. First of all, we're able to say that this limit does not exist. And that's why looking at this scratched out frame, that's where this frame comes from. That's where this phrase comes from. Even though our quotient rule fails, it allows us to determine that the limit doesn't exist. Hence, we call this a determinate form. But we can say more than that. If we try to take the limit of a quotient and we end up with something that looks like this, and if this notation is a is abominable, but hopefully it's clear. If we try to take this limit, then we get a non-zero number up top divided by zero. Then at least the one-sided limits, are either positive or negative infinity. So if this happens, the limits fail to exist, first of all. And the limits fail to exist in a very specific way. As X is approaching C, the, this fraction is either exploding up to positive infinity or exploding down to negative infinity. Why the one-sided limits? Well, again, just because you have to be careful with this notation. Um, the limit as X approaches two of one divided by X minus two. Coming back to this example, if we try to just use the quotient rule, the limit of one is one, the limit of x minus two is zero. So we're in this determinate form. We've got a non-zero number up top. And then we've got a zero down below. And according to what I say on the last frame, that should mean that these one-sided limits are either infinity or negative infinity. And we already looked at this example on Desmos, and that was precisely what we found, that the one-sided limits are indeed positive and negative infinity. 
And this might seem sort of, all might seem kind of abstract. These limits actually do pop up in applied situations. Like, let me not go into any kind of detail here. Let me just give the briefest and roughest sketch to try to convince ourselves that this topic does appear in a five setting. And we'll look at zoology. And we'll make the statement that most animals have some sort, or at least most kind of advanced animals, have some sort of mating rituals. And we might wonder why that is. I mean, peacocks, for example. Why should peacocks have evolved such plumage as part of their courtship behavior? I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, there doesn't seem to be any evolutionary advantage to having that kind of plumage. So why should it have happened? Well, suppose you're looking at a reasonably advanced animal, so a vertebrae, say a bird or a mammal or something like that. And suppose such an animal has no sort of courtship behavior. If you're. So for this theoretical species, reproduction is a matter of pure chance. For reproduction to occur, a male and a female animal just have to meet during the mating season. Well, this kind of seemingly a very natural thing would lead to ecological disaster if it happened. Under certain natural assumptions, there is a time C such that if we look at this animal population as time approaches C, this animal population, let me fix that. Blows up to infinity. That is under certain conditions, if the animal just doesn't have any kind of courtship behavior and just relies on random chance for reproduction to occur, then the animal population will grow to infinity in a finite time. And that can't possibly occur in the real world. Right. I mean, you can't say, 
by next fall, there will be an infinite number of deer in Shadron. So um, that's why most animals have some kind of courtship behavior. It's necessary to avoid ecological collapse. And you see that as part of this analysis, we have what we've been discussing today. We look at a limit of a function, whereas T, the variable, approaches C, the function explodes to positive infinity. So even though infinity as a concept might seem kind of abstract, the stuff we've been talking about today does show up when you're investigating very concrete questions. It is applied mathematics. This section is broken into two pieces and those pieces are basically unrelated to each other, except that they both involve an infinity symbol. Um, we've finished that first piece. We've talked about these infinite limits or infinite non-limits to be more precise. Does anybody have any questions before we move on and start the next piece of this section? Then the next piece of this section is limits at infinity. And the idea of this topic is that instead of letting X approach some number C. We ask what happens as X explodes up to, for now, let's just say explodes up to positive infinity. So instead of asking what happens, as X approaches a number, we ask what happens as X gets bigger and bigger. And our notation for this is that instead of having a number C down here, we'll write to the infinity symbol. The limit as X approaches infinity of F of X. And without any divvy dallying, let's go immediately look at an example of this on Desmos. So You've all taken some kind of trigonometry. So you've all seen the inverse tangent. I mean, whether or not you remember it that well, that's okay. We are not uh, requiring you to be a master of this. Um, you might have seen I mean, if this is looking totally unfamiliar, 
It might be because your textbook used that notation, pan superscript negative one X instead of arc tangent. Those are two different ways of saying the same thing. But here's a graph of the arc tangent. And let's ask what happens as X gets bigger and bigger. Like if X is 10, the arc tangent is about 1.47. If X is 100, the arc tangent is about 1.56. If F is a thousand, ten thousand, one hundred thousand, it looks like these values of F of X are approaching some finite number. It looks like these values of F of X are approaching one point five, seven, something. And those of you who do remember this material well might uh, even know uh, more precisely what's happening. As X is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, F of X is getting closer and closer and closer to pi divided by two. So this is an example with an infinite limit. The limit as X approaches infinity of the arc tangent of X is pi divided by two. Um, we can also talk almost all, in fact, every real world application I can think of of this material is the limit as X goes to positive infinity. Let me just put this out there. That instead of asking what happens as X gets really, really big, we could ask what happens as X gets really, really small. That's, I always sort of, find it awkward to talk about, because when I say small, most people probably think close to zero. But I mean, what happens as X is negative 1,000, negative 1 billion, negative 1 trillion, and so on. And an application of this, that's coming to mind is probably a lot, uh, a lot more familiar than the arc tangent. <clears throat> if you look at f of x equals e to the x, and do let x be negative 10, negative 100 at this point, this is getting close to zero so fast. We're running into rounding error, but you see as X gets big in the negative direction, this function gets close to zero very quickly. And when X is negative a thousand, it's not literally zero, but it's so close to zero that even Desmos which up here is keeping 44 decimal faces. At this point, even Desmos is like, okay, let's just round this thing. 
So that's an example. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of e to the x is zero. And I have a few things to say about this. Clearly, we're not going to finish this section today, but maybe the first and most important thing I want to say is that these are real limits. So earlier today, um, we can go back real quick when we introduced infinite limits. I put the word limit in scare quotes because I mean, these aren't real limits. This is a way of saying that the limit doesn't exist in a particular way. Here, you'll notice that limits is not in scare quotes. These are real limits, and everything we've said about limits at C is also true about limits at infinity. The big exception, unfortunately, is that infinity is not a number. So we cannot talk about continuity. There is no question of being continuous at infinity because functions aren't defined at infinity. Infinity is not a number. And because of this, these limits tend to be much harder to find. And assuming that we follow along with the textbook, which I always have uh, when I've taught this course, we're not even going to learn the main trick for finding these limits this semester. The textbook puts it off until chapter seven, which is calculus two. So we'll learn at least one trick tomorrow, but we're going to put a lot of this stuff off until later bring us to the end of fast. I 